so excited to be with you and so excited to bring this message. I don't know how many of you have kids or know of small children who, um, they're what I call wires, not to be confused with whiners, but wires, like where they just are constantly saying, why? So you will explain something, you will take the time, you will, you will give a great explanation. You think they understand and they look at you and they go, but why? And then you just try it again and you try to narrow it down and you ask them, or you explain it again in a little bit more detailed and you think for sure they get it. And then they go, why? And, and you just see this why this why question that is just in them, and some have it more than others, but all of us actually have been wired for asking the why question. So you may be asking, why are we wired for the why question? Glad you asked. It's because God has given us purpose. And one of the two biggest Philosophical questions on this planet are, why am I here and who am I? Who am I and why am I here? The two are, are not mutually exclusive. The two actually go together. And the Bible, in its wisdom, makes sure that throughout it, we know what our purpose is. We are, we are clued in to the why of why we are on this planet. And in Isaiah, did you notice how I said that? I said, I said Isaiah. <laughs> Come on, it's only taken me nine years to do that. <laughs> Could you pass me my water? <laughs> Banana. Tomato. No, tomato. Okay, there it is. Okay. I can't do it. In Isaiah, Isaiah, God speaks through the prophet to tell the people of God why they're here and who they belong to. Chapter 43, verse 7. This is God speaking through the prophet. Everyone who's called by my name whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So we were made for his glory. Goes on to say in verse 10, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. And my servant, and he's talking about my servant being my people, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. I declared, and I saved, and I proclaimed, and there was no strange God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am the God. What he's saying is those who belong to God become the living proof of his glory. Therefore, we are to become witnesses to testify to the world that God is indeed glorious because he is our creator, he is our savior, and he is our redeemer. Because God is our creator, because God is our savior, there is no other savior, and he's our redeemer. So he made you, he saved you, and redeemed you. Redeem you means he's, he's rebuilding you, he's remaking you, he's taking the broken places, the places that need healing in any aspect of our lives, and he's bringing them and he's making them new again. So we were made for the glory of God, but the glory of God has a context. You and I were not just made to give glory to God outside of God, we were made to give glory to God in a relationship with God. 
You cannot actually fulfill, we cannot actually fulfill our purpose apart from a relationship with God because God is a relational God. And he made us for relationship. And this relationship is to be one that is glorious. And the glorious relationship that we have is one to be enjoyed. Did you get that? So in Reformed theology, it says, what is the chief end of man? It's, it's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. How do you enjoy him? In the context of relationship. So if you're somebody here who grew up in church world or outside of church world and you're now coming in and we're glad that you're here and you're kind of exploring what this Christian faith is, this Christian faith has very little to do with the religion and has everything to do with the relationship. So therefore, if you're somebody who's thinking, okay, at the end of my life when I face God, I'm going to say, I did this for you, I did this for you, I showed up for that, I attended this, I, 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 you know, I, 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 I ticked all those boxes. If you're somebody who's thinking that you're going to glorify God by your works, your deeds, your good deeds, apart from from a relationship, outside of a relationship, I'm going to tell you something right now. It will not be glorious. You can only glorify God in a relationship with Him, not apart from Him. So to step into a relationship means you stepping into a relationship through His Son, your Savior and my Savior. If Jesus is not your Savior, then I ask the question, who is? Because God said, I'm your only Savior. So apart from me, there is no saving. Apart from me, there's no creating. And apart from me, there is no redeeming. So it's either in a relationship with Jesus to give, you, give him glory to the Father or it's not. So to fulfill your purpose, of which, by the way, every person in this room has the same exact purpose. You don't have a different purpose from the person sitting next to you. You don't have a different purpose from the person behind you or in front of you. You all, we all, every person who has lived, is living, will ever live, has the same purpose to glorify God and enjoy Him in the context of this beautiful, glorious relationship. Because in the relationship, you actually experience personally, intimately, His love, His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness, His power, everything that goes along with who God is in terms of his characteristics, that is enjoyed in the relationship, not outside of the relationship. You're just a window shopper looking in. And those of us who've already stepped into this relationship, as Isaiah says, we then are to become the billboards, the walking billboards of this life, testifying that God is my creator, God is my savior, and God is my redeemer. So we all have the same purpose. So once you stepped into this relationship, then you would say to yourself, okay, maybe since we all have the same purpose, maybe we have different missions. Oh, that's, that makes sense. We have different missions. How I glorify God is going to be different than how... No, 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 no. When you step into a relationship with Jesus Christ, actually, not only... Do you have the same purpose to glorify God and enjoy Him forever? You actually have the same mission. The mission is to go and make disciples of all peoples and all nations. That's the same mission. So if you're in a relationship with Jesus, your mission is no different than any. Now you, go, you look at me and you go, oh, well, Glenn, well, that's, your mission's different than mine. No, it isn't. You say, yeah, but you're a lead pastor. Well, I was. And... Um, See, and you know, I'm no longer. I'm now uh, just kind of Glenn. It's just, but no matter what I do, I'm on the same mission as you. So if you drive a bread truck, your mission is the same as mine as a pastor. 
If you are a doctor, your mission is the same. If you're a lawyer, even lawyers actually have the same mission. I mean, even lawyers. God even has a place for lawyers in this world. It's unbelievable. He doesn't exclude them. Accountants, you have the same mission. You have the same purpose, the same mission. We all have the same glorious purpose. We all have the same kingdom mission. But here's where, this is where I'm going to dive in because we're in a, a series on our steps and, and this step is called the purpose step. It's not you know, you finally get to this one. This is just one of the steps. We're just, it's just coming last in this series. We have the same purpose. We have the same mission. But here's where it gets individual. Here's where it gets unique. Here's where it gets so incredibly exciting. And that is, this is where you find out what your kingdom burden is. Same purpose, same mission, but unique kingdom burden burden. This is where I will flesh something out differently than somebody else. This is where the person next to you and, and in front of you, behind you, will, will, will gather together their gifting, their wiring, how God wired them together, the, put the strengths, the gifts, the talents, the interests, all that make you, you. There's never been one. There is never going to be one like you. You are one of a kind, and God has uniquely given you a burden to expand his kingdom in which you can enjoy that in this beautiful God-glorifying purpose. So what's your burden? That's the process that each one of you needs to be on right now. It's the process of discovery. Nehemiah, somebody that we've taken a look at before, is somebody who discovered in a moment his burden, his kingdom burden. But God was stirring within him long before he actually discovered. So the very first part of discovering your kingdom burden, how you're going to flesh it out, how you're going to live it out, how you're going to practically um, deal with a certain area of society or a certain group of people of which you're going to bring this God-given God-glorifying, kingdom-extending burden to, God begins by stirring. So you need to begin to pray, God, stir in my heart. Stir in my heart the thing that you have wired me for so that I can enjoy you in this glorifying relationship and to fulfill my mission, but to do it in the uniqueness of who you've made me to be. So Nehemiah, in a moment, finds, finds out that um, his countrymen back in Jerusalem, he's living in Persia. He's actually the cupbearer to the king, which means in our day, he's like the chief of staff. He was a big deal, a trusted, trusted member of the king's staff. He finds out that Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem are torn down and the gates are burned. And that his people are vulnerable and they're living in shame and disgrace. And in this moment, he weeps, he mourns, he fasts, he prays until God gives him and develops within him his burden. In that moment, he was burdened for a people. The project was putting the walls up, but the burden was for people. Listen, no matter what your kingdom burden is, it's always going to be about people. Because God is a God of relationship. Now, you might say, well, I want to do something about homelessness. That's great. Who lives in homes? Who doesn't live in homes? People. 
So homelessness, doing something about homelessness without actually dealing with people is just a social program. As a kingdom burden, you are always going to bring about not only a roof over somebody's head, but you're trying to bring them into a place of restoration with the Heavenly Father. Because every kingdom burden has relationship at its core, and the relationship that we witness, the relationship that we testify to, is the one who created us, who saved us, and is now redeeming us. So that's what this is all about. So no matter what it is that God stirs your heart for, it's always going to have a particular audience in mind. And Nehemiah's audience were the people of Jerusalem. So in chapter 2, let me read this to you. This is the words, these are the words of, G, um, of Nehemiah. And he's kind of given his own. He's gone out in the night. He's, he, he's surveyed. He, he's inspected the walls. It's terrible. It's bad. It's, it's major rubble. It's a major project of, of being able to rally this group of people who are living there. These literally kind of ragtag group of Jews who are living in shame and disgrace. He's going to rally them to do this work. Verse 17, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruin with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision, disgrace. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. Man, they're inspired. They get motivated. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. I'm going to stop there. So that's what gets going. He surveys. He takes a look. So in this stirring, in this place of brokenness, which can I just pause for a moment? If you're driving around the streets of Joburg, or if you're watching on YouTube, and whatever city you're living in. And something starts to grip your heart. And you say something to the extent of, gosh, somebody ought to do something about that. That might be God's way of saying, you. Because that's the beginning of a stirring. Then, when it grips you to the point you literally can't drive in your city, and you literally can't drive past that, whatever that is, and you go, I must do something about that, then you know that that is your kingdom burden. When it grips you that you are so compelled. See, there's, there's a positive and the negative version of the word burden. So in a, in a couple days, we have two incredible psychologists who are coming to talk about fear, anxiety, stress, and depression. It is gripping people worldwide. That anxiety is a negative burden, something that weighs you down. It's so heavy, it just crushes you. But this, a kingdom burden, is something that compels you, inspires you, motivates you to, to action for the kingdom of God to bring a person or bring a people to restoration to that creator, that savior, and that redeemer. That's a healthy burden, and that's what we're talking about. This healthy burden is a, it, you're compelled. The stirring compels you to move into action. So there are four things that I want you to take a look at with Nehemiah. And the first one is a reason to rally. The reason to rally is because there's a place of brokenness. Wherever your burden is, there's going to be an area of brokenness. 
For him, he was moved by the brokenness of the, the shame and the disgrace and the vulnerability of, of, these, of this remnant living in Jerusalem. And he was moved, stirred to action. He wept and he mourned. See, there's usually an emotional response that goes with you're wanting to do something. See, you're not, we're not stones. We, 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 uh, we're, we're wild spiritually, intellectually, physically, and emotionally. And emotionally, you're gripped. And it triggers your mind, intellectual. And then it triggers something spiritually. And then ultimately, it says, okay, now let me flesh this out physically. So for Nehemiah, he was moved to tears. What moves you to tears? Do you know why I came here nine years ago? Because it was a career advancement? I was, I came here. Do you know what started everything? Tears. Tears. A friend of mine sent me an email saying, he said, I know you're, you're really interested and you have a real soft spot for South Africa. You lived there for three years. I'm sending this to you. It's, it's from a mission magazine and it's all about South Africa. And South Africa at that time, and I, I don't think anything has changed, that one third of their entire population is 15 years and younger. So anytime when a society has that many teenagers, there's just not enough adults. There's not enough adult leadership pouring into them. That's never a good place to be as a nation. And when I read it, it moved me to tears. And my tears said, I've got to do something about it. And it was a stirring. That's why I came. I didn't come here to lead and pastor a church. I came here to reach a generation of, of young people and to, to rally a group of adults to pour into them to change the course of lives and hopefully a nation. That's why I came. What moves you to tears? So there's the rallying moment. It says, we are living in shame and disgrace. And I love how Nehemiah puts it. He doesn't say, you are living in shame and disgrace. Shame. He says, we. We. Do you see what's going on? We. He never even lived in Jerusalem. He grew up in captivity in Persia. But he's saying, I am a part of the we. So if you want to be a part of bringing wholeness to brokenness, you have to literally include yourself into the we. We must do something about this. So there's a reason to rally. Helping others to acknowledge the brokenness and their great need. The second thing is a rally cry. A rally cry. Come. The time has come. It's now here. Come, let us build the wall. Now, for some of you, as you read this, or as, if you're hearing this for the first time, you might think that, that Nehemiah's kingdom burden was actually building the wall. That was just the project. It was a means to an end. His ultimate end was the restoration of a community of God to the Heavenly Father. He wanted to restore this people to their heavenly father. That's the ultimate destination. The wall was the building project. We, we are in the process, we're in phase two of City Green building. We're building not because that's the end. We're building so that we can bring restoration to people's lives, to marriages, families, whole, whole aspects of society, young people, little children, 
older people, everybody. This building project is just a means for which we are trying to bring restoration. It's, we're, we're just like a giant aircraft carrier. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you come in once a week, and then we, we refuel, we recharge, and then we just send you right off the deck back out to do your mission and to fulfill your kingdom burden so that you can glorify God. So that's what's happening. So come, let us build the world. I want to say something because I think, I think um, there's a misconception among a lot of people in church. So not just this church, but church universal. They think that the ultimate destination of their lives is actually heaven. Can I just correct you on that? Heaven is not your ultimate destination. A restored relationship with your heavenly father is. Because where your father is, that's where you'll be. Because restored relationship with the father then opens the door for home with him. And home is heaven. So heaven is not your destination. It's a relationship with the Heavenly Father. That really actually makes sense when you feel and when you hear and you read what we've just talked about, that you were made for the glory of God. You were made for relationships. So the ultimate destination is to be restored back to that relationship with the Father, and you do it through Jesus, the one who saves. Rally cry. Rally report. When God stirs, when God stirs, he will then seize your heart and then he'll start to do the things that he needs to do. So your heart is first stirred, then your heart is seized, it's gripped, and then you begin to, to work in this plan with God, whatever that plan is, to bring restoration to a particular group of people. And then he will confirm it. He will, give you, he will give you evidence that he is in it with you and in it for you. That he has actually been preparing your heart long before you were even stirred. And he's going to stir in the hearts of the people like he did here long before Nehemiah even showed up. And Nehemiah then gives confirmation. He says earlier in, in verse 12, he says, Then I rose at night, I and a few men with me. This is where they go out on a little night tour of the wall. And I told no one what God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. So he already is telling them that this effort, this wall building effort, this gate repairing um, project is not his idea. It's God putting it in his heart. And that is so crucial. What is God putting in your heart? This can't just be your idea. This can't just be your plan. And then you ask God to come and bless it. That never goes well. What is God birthing in you what is he stirred in you? What is seizing your heart? And then you know, oh, this is a godly revelation. He's calling me to do this for this particular group of people. So he says, I told the people, I told them that the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. And then he goes on to say, and even the words that the king had spoken to me. Basically, if you want evidence that this is a God, God effort, he gets a Persian pagan king to not only release Nehemiah to do the work, but he, gets, he, he puts it on the king's heart to foot the bill. He pays for the thing. Can you imagine the local Joburg council coming to me and saying, Glenn, we hear what you're doing at City Green. We want to pay for it. I mean, if you needed any evidence that that was a miracle of God, it would be that. So God himself has put it on a pagan king's heart to pay for the thing. 
and he gives Nehemiah the travel visas, the work visas, the supplies, the food, the everything. That's a God effort. That's what God does. When God grips you with your own burden, things will happen that you will never be able to plan or count on because God is bringing them from a heavenly place and you just will literally look and go, God, you're good. God, you're good. I, I couldn't have done this. I couldn't have pulled this off. You did this. Do you know how many people who were contractors on, on this property who came and said, we believe in what you're doing and we'll give it to you at cost? Can I tell you that many of them were not believers? They saved us millions of rand. Over the, over the course of the, of the entire sum total of this project, we were spared millions of rand. We did this for such a small amount of money. You know why? Because our God has all the resources. So when you step into a kingdom burden, you go, I don't know where we're going to get the resources. I don't know how it's going to happen. Don't worry. He's got them all. And in his time and in his way, he'll make it happen. Rally response, the fourth thing. He said, so the people then say, let us rise and build. So this is like this moment that Nehemiah has been praying about for almost two months, a little over two months. And finally, this group of people catch hold of his burden, grab a hold of his vision, and they say, you know what? We've been inspired. We've been motivated. Now we're ready to build. See, God will bring the people around to say, we'll join you in this burden. It's so exciting. This is where you know that when God has put something on your heart that is so, uniquely to, so unique to you that you can't plan for it, but God just orders the steps. He will then put it on people's hearts. But I want to say something. There are many of you who've been stirred before. You felt a burden for a particular group of people. You've been driving around Joburg and you go, man, I want to do something about that. You've been inspired. You've been motivated. But you never go to action. I want you to read this one verse with me. The second part of verse 18 says, So they strengthened their hands for the good work. It's not enough to be inspired. It's not enough to be, to be motivated. You've got to actually roll up your sleeves and perspire. So inspiration plus motivation plus perspiration will equal restoration. Inspiration plus motivation plus perspiration, getting out and doing it, will bring about the restoration. This isn't wishful thinking. This is actually practical application. you got to action it. One of the things that I have witnessed in helping people to discover what their kingdom burden is, we'll take them through this whole process of which I'm going to share with you in just a few moments, quickly, although it's my last preach, so I don't care. I can go on all day. Um, is that people will get to the, the, the place where we've, we've, we've literally... We funneled all this information about who they are, how they've been wired, the, the uniqueness of who they are. And then we start to discover what their, their passions are. And from their passions, all of a sudden, things start to materialize. And we get this one burden statement that is uniquely them. And we write it out and they go. And oftentimes, it brings them to tears. And they're so moved. They're inspired. They're motivated. 
but we who help them to discover it can't do it for them because God put it on their heart. And it's that moment, it's the critical moment where you're literally going, will I do the perspiration, the investment of my life with my time, my talent, and my treasure into this? It's the make or break moment. And I think many of us have gotten close to that. Some of you have literally, this is new stuff to you. You never even knew that there was a kingdom burden kind of opportunity out there. Some of you never even knew what your purpose was on this planet according to the Bible to, to glorify God. So the, we're all over the show, and that's okay because that's what usually happens uh, on any given Sunday. We have people all over the spectrum. So don't feel like, oh, I'm not where they are. Don't worry about where they are. Worry about where you are. And worry about what your next step is. That's what we are all about, helping you take your next step. Because everybody's got a next step to take. So, if you've gotten to that point of discovery and you've never stepped, I want to encourage you today. I don't want to slam you and shame you. I want to encourage you. That's so beautiful that God took the time to allow you to discover that, and now he's calling you to live it out. And it might take you two months like Nehemiah to pray about it. It might take two years. I prayed for two years after my tears before God ever opened the door for me to come back here. Or it might take two minutes because you know it's right there in front of you. So I want to encourage you. So what does this discovery process look like? The discovery process actually um, is incredibly simple when I explain it. And so I'm going to go quickly, and they'll, they'll have some subheadings coming up. So if you want to take notes, I, I'd take notes. Because you can do this on your own. So this is like your cheat sheet. And you can do this on your own, or if you want to do this within your... This would be a great thing to do within the context of your small group, if you're in one. Mine's right over there. They're going to do it. Someday. Hopefully soon. My personal wiring, okay? That's the first thing. You need to ask yourself, how did God make me? So we use a tool called Strength Finders. You can go online, strengthfinders.com. And it is an incredibly intense, comprehensive look at who you are. And it will give you, if you want, the first five strengths of who you are and how they're wired. And the, and the priorities, or if you want the first 10, you can do that. You have to pay a little bit more money. Um, you know, you can do all 38. But every person has got strengths. And these strengths are incredibly unique to each one of you. I would start there. Because it's an incredible, complex algorithms that they use to get you to this place. And then all of a sudden, when you read it, you're like, man, I do I do operate like that. This is the way I do think. And what, what you'll find out, what is so natural to you, other people are going, how did you do that? And I'll go like, well, I don't know. I just do it. But Glenn, how did you do that? I don't know. Because it's so a part of you. So strength finders. Then you can take, there are a gazillion spiritual gifts tests. Now, you, know, you take those and you probably also need to include some people with you who know you. So that, you know, all of a sudden somebody says, you know, I'm a preacher, but you've never preached? Ah, uh, you know, you might want to just kind of pull that back a little bit. I'm a teacher, but you've never taught anybody. Oh, okay. But, um, so you need to be able to be honest with yourself with some other people who will do that. So then you take a look and you write down your interests and your hobbies. What are the things that if you had free time to do, what would you do? Write them down. Then you look at your personal skill set. What are the things that you, you, if you got a university degree or if you got special, specialized training in something, you take a look at all of that and you put it up. And you take a look at your own experience uh, from, your, 
from education all the way through to your work experience. You put that down, all your qualifications. And then ask yourself some of the things. What is the type of literature that you like to read? You know, and if some of you who are like, I don't like to read, I just like to look at the pictures, you need to pay attention to that. Okay, so you're a visual person. I just saved you. <laughs> and you can look at the subjects and, and, and ask yourself, what is it that I do like to spend my time reading? Because that will give you a better picture of who you are. Then you move on to your personal history. Personal history. I want you to think about your earliest memory that's attached to a significant emotion. Your earliest memory. A lot of people actually kind of go back to a birthday. Something happened at a birthday. It could be good, it could be bad, it could be neutral. It just, it's your earliest memory. And what was it? Because sometimes that will really give you an indication of what shaped you. So these are the key influencers in your life. And then I want you to look at the people that if you had to look back over the course of your life, who were the people that really significantly influenced you for the good? Was it a coach? Was it a teacher? Was it a youth minister? Was it, was it a, your older brother? Was it a, you know, who was it? A grandfather, your parents. And what was it about them that inspired you and they influenced? So you move on from that. And then you get to my personal passion points. You examine and you identify the things, the situations, the things that you're regularly observing. Now sometimes, you know, one of those like gut-wrenching, heart-grabbing commercials or adverts will show up on TV and you're like, oh, I'd, I'd love to do something about that. And then it goes, and then you watch whatever, and you forget about it. But what's something that you have observed that you're like, man, I'm driving around Joburg, and I look, and I go, wish somebody would do something about that. I'd like to do something about it. List those things. And then you get to your kingdom burden. So I'm, I'm wrapping up here. The kingdom burden considers all three aspects of discovery. That is God's stirring, which is his revelation. The brokenness, that's your stirring. And compassion, meaning that you're stirred to action. When you pull all those three things together, God's stirring, your stirring, and stirring towards action, you're ready to move. And then you can come and say, I must do something for this particular group of people. I have countless, countless examples. I don't have the time to go into it. But let me just share with one, one lady in our church. She was at, she was at a hospital visiting somebody, and she noticed all these um, pregnant moms coming in to have their babies. And one of the big crises in this city is that moms feel so hopeless, impoverished moms, and they just feel like, I can't, I have nothing to raise this child. And nobody's there to help me, and I don't have this community, and they abandon their babies. And so she was stirred by this brokenness and this hopelessness. And, and literally, she said, what could I do to bring some hope to these, to these ladies who are hopeless so that they, could, so that they won't abandon their babies and that they, 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 they could hear uh, the message of restoration but have some tangible evidence that says somebody cares? So she started a thing called the Baby Box Pro Project where she put together just nappies and baby wipes and all the other kinds of stuff, little, little garments the kids could make and so on. She included other people. People started knitting for her. And then she would take them and then they would sit down with each new mom. They would give them the box. Then they would counsel them and they would take them, not just here's, here's a box of supplies. Let's talk about the hope and where hope comes from. And they would share the message. And they have prayed with countless numbers of women in this city. It was just a burden to give hope to a mom at a place where she is probably the most vulnerable she could be. And she brought hope. 
and restoration and something tangible. What is it that God is stirring for you? I'm walking down. I'm getting fired up. This isn't, this isn't a message from up there for, for a select few. This is for all of you. What's God doing? There's some people sitting over here. They're doing stuff in education. Candace Trump and her, her team. There's so many people doing things that their hearts are moved. What is it that you're going to do? Where's your heart going to be stirred? This is how we glorify God. We fulfill the mission. And you get to exercise the kingdom burden for why you were uniquely and wired and made. It's exciting. It's awesome. That's when the gospel gets real. Good news gets out of us and we proclaim it with our lives. Amen? I'm done. It's your time. So if you or somebody in this room who's saying, I've been stirred tonight or today, and you are going, I at least want to start the process of discovery, I'm going to ask you to stand.